I'm very excited about this uh, next session because over the next three hours, um, we're going to hold a combined LOINC committee meeting. Uh, excuse me. We're going to hold a combined LOINC committee meeting. It's been quite some time since we held an all committee meeting and since we met in person. Can I have everyone's attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is an open session and um, a time to get caught up on what's happening in uh, the committees and what the, each of the committees has been working on and to have a cross-committee dialogue. Um, and that is essential in keeping LOINC uh, relevant and current. And uh, what's important to note it, that while this is a, you know, a cross, we're going to have cross committee dialogue, there will be some items that we won't be able to resolve today. But we do have a plan for uh, cross committee collaboration to come to resolution. Uh, if you're new to LOINC, our committees are clinical, laboratory, radiology, uh, and uh, previously known as RADLEX. We also have nursing and documentology uh, subcommittees. Um, we are thrilled that our chairs and co-chairs um, are joining us, including Stan Huff and Ted Klein, who co-chaired the clinical committee. Stan is here, and I believe uh, Ted is uh, participating online. Pam Banning. Uh, chair of the LOINC committee is uh, participating online. Rob McClure, who chairs a document ontology, is with us today in the back. Uh, Lisa Anderson is also here, and she co-chairs um, nursing subcommittee with uh, Randy Woodward. And Ken uh, Wang, who chairs the radiology committee, is joining us virtually. Here is a, a quick uh, high-level glance at the agenda. Each committee chair and co-chair will provide an update on what has been happening in their committees. And some committees may have um, discussion topics that they want to discuss more broadly. And while the chairs and co-chairs will lead and chair their discussions, Virginia Real is here. Virginia, where are you? Uh, uh, to facilitate our meeting to ensure we stay on track and watchful of um, cross-committee items. So with that, the clinical committee is up first, and I'll ask Stan to come to the floor, and we'll begin the cl clinical committee update and discussion. Great. <clears throat> So if, if you've forgotten, I'm Stan Huff. Uh, <laughs> put on a different hat here. So uh, now working uh, in this session as the one of the co-chairs of the clinical committee, along with Ted Klein. Uh, I, we were hoping Ted was going to be here in person, but he is online. but he's online. There, great. Thanks, Ted. Um, so uh, we've got a series of. Uh, of things here. The first thing that we want to do is, um, you know, I attended uh, the SNOMED meeting in Lisbon a, a few weeks ago, and a lot of great work was going on uh, by uh, Scott Campbell in the area of anatomic pathology. And uh, so I invited Scott to, uh, as the first thing, uh, to give us uh, an update on, on that work. Uh, we'd like to take about 15 minutes for that. Um, and then uh, there's some other topics, and uh, we'll just go through these. If uh, We'll stop, though, on time, uh, and if we don't get these things done, then we'll carry them over into uh, the online uh, normal meetings, if you will, uh, subsequent to this meeting. So, Scott, if you want to come forward, and uh, I hope you or somebody made an arrangement for your slides to be able to be shown. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Best people working on it. Okay. Yeah, you've got, got, the, you've got the right people working. All right. 
So all, all good, Marjorie? To hit anything? Hit, hit, hit the any button. Okay. Okay. Is that you? That'd be me. That's you? Oh, and that's still me. There you go. And that's even better. Awesome. Thank you, Marjorie. Well, hi, I'm Scott Campbell. I'm a colleague of Jim Campbell, not related. And it's actually, he's thankful for that every day. Um, I'm from the University of Nebraska. I'm in the Department of Pathology and Microbiology. I am not a pathologist, and I am not licensed to use latex gloves for anything other than caustic <laughs> chemicals. Um, this actually is a project that um, Daniel, I forgot I, at the last minute I was going to put in our citation, but this is actually a project that dates, that we're going to talk about, that dates back to the original agreement with, with Reagan Street and Snowmed, and it's cancer synoptic reporting. So for those of you who aren't familiar with cancer synoptic reporting, I'm very brief background, and then I just want to show you some of the work we've done. Um, and actually, this is one of the projects I think will benefit greatly with the collaboration because there is content here that really could get into other nations' hands that would be very beneficial for, you know, the worldwide, you know, deals with research, treatment, or whatnot of cancer. So pathologists, if for those of you who aren't familiar with anatomical pathology, surgeons go in and take something out of your body usually with your permission, and if it is cancerous, or, or actually they hand it then to the pathologist, so the gross room is in fact gross, very large pieces of flesh that are cut down and then examined to see if the cell function is, a, is normal or is it, is, it, is it malignant, right? Well, that's considered the gold standard of diagnostics for cancer at this point in time in our existence. So it is a standard way that the, these data are reported. It's a subset of reports, if you would, that is used, or it's a subset of, of a minimal data set of sorts that's specific to cancer that is used by the clinician and the surgeon for treatment um, and, and, and for prognoses. It has been evolving, this pathology report has been evolving for a while, and the problem is we need to get it more concordant with how it's promoted, um, computed nationally and ingested into our registries shared globally. Um, this is an example, I always call this pathology poetry. Um, this is your typical pathology report and, and you know pathologists do tend to be quiet except they bloviate a little bit because the only thing that really matters to the patient in this case is what's in red. Everything else is our filler word. So um, what I'd also like to say is that um, this is hard to find as you can all imagine. It's lost to the PDF once it's actually been read once and it's really hard to get very, very valuable data out of this. The problem is, or not the problem, but the experience is that the College of American Pathologists, the Australians, the Brits, ICCR, International Collaboration of Cancer Reporting, Podlica in the, in the Netherlands, all use a structured report that is highly concordant with um, each other, um, other than the Brits spell funny. Um, just want to say they've completely ruined the language that they started. Um, but that being said, the, the value sets that are, are, we're looking at here are broadly agreed upon. As I evaluate cancer synoptic reporting or the d minimum data element to, I, to assess and, and prognosticate a patient's uh, care, are highly aligned, over 95% agreement, except for O and U and tumor. Um, so highly concordant. Um, our friends from Canada Infoway, um, your boss, Andrew McLean, is on this paper. And pathology has been evolving, the, 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 the tenure of uh, or how we report. And it's gone from that narrative form, and it's moving towards this level six, which is a fully encoded report. And our intention was to make this a semantic and logically understood report in addition to uh, consistently computed. So with that in mind, um, back in 2014, um, my chancellor went to my chair and was complaining a while and saying, we don't have enough clinical trials going on here at the Univers University of Nebraska. And all the oncologists say it's your fault, the pathologists. Right, of course. And the pathologists, of course, you know they're so outspoken. And the best they could do is look at the other guy's shoe. But that's an inside joke. Um, so 
What the options, however, were very limited. And I go back to a study, and I and Daniel, I can't remember if you were on this study or Clem, if you were on that study, but back to in in two thousand nine, and actually the predis, the preceding report in two thousand five, looked at can we get cancer pathology data from a synoptic report into our registries in the in the CDC, and can we use SNOMED and or LOINC to do that? And the answer was. It would be great, but neither terminology had sufficient specificity and definition to make that a reality. So we had a real shortfall in both the two primary terminologies that could be used for that in the U.S. domain. So with that in mind, in 2014, and the chancellor's uh, threat to my chair, who I liked. So if I didn't like my chair, I wouldn't have done this. But anyway, we said we're going to try and, adjust, uh, and address this. And so what we did in 2014, we uh, crashed, Jim Campbell and I crashed a meeting in London um, that was a close nomad meeting and set up our own project group. And, and it eventually turned into a full-on project in 2020. The objective here was to create all the SNOMED CT content that's necessary to represent 100% of all the data elements in a cancer synoptic report for all protocols. Um, we would use the observable entity concept model that was that was started as part of the collaborative collaborative agreement. We would um, do the very thing that Clem was talking about and others that you have to investigate. You have to investigate and understand exactly what the clinician or the pathologist is going to say before you author a term. So in order to be right, you have to go to the people who theoretically know the right answers. We would do the initial work in our extension in Nebraska and eventually got moved into the, um, into the community authoring platform that, that um, Reagan Street would be able to use now. 85, so where are we at now? 85 to 95% of all solid tumor content is authored and is in the international release at this point in time or is in the pipeline. About 5% is left because we're fighting about what's the difference between this dysplasia and this neoplasia. And it's something only pathologists will worry about. Um, over 700 concepts are published now in the international release. Rob, to your point, I think I just did a quick query. 445 of those concepts are fully defined. Um, some you just can't do. Just SNOMED model doesn't, doesn't accommodate that yet. Um, immunohistochemistry is concerned, and we are currently completing the full-on map set release for the College of Microbiologists who will distribute it in their, their own fashion, as well as to the ICCR. And however they want to do it. So major categories, tumor site, that was easy. Histologic types of neoplasms, histologic grades of neoplasm, processes, um, including invasion, both direct and metastatic, involvement of lymph nodes, surgical margins out the wazoo. Um, the anus one was included there. Um, and tumor stage, um, AJCC 8th edition is actually included in SNOMED at this point in time, which is great. So what does this really look like? Well, this is a SNOMED view of what a LOINC concept kind of would be kind of tangential here. But this is a histologic type of primary malignant neoplasm of breast. And actually, you might notice some of these concepts are pretty similar to what you would see in the LOINC model. So we're measuring a property. In this case, it's a histologic type. Um, it inheres in, and there's some really wonky ontology words here, but that histologic type exists in the primary malignant neoplasm that in this case is located in the breast. It's a single point in time measurement and the scale type is nominal because the results are going to be words, adenocarcinoma, right? Um, there's a link to, to the uh, uh, implementation guide from um, if you get into our Confluence site. But what's this look like in reality? Well, from the College of American Pathologists, this is just a section out of the, uh, out of the breast protocol and this is how it would look encoded. Now, what's nice about this is with the one-to-one -one relationship with LOINC, this content can be distributed to all the nations that don't use SNOMED in their AP systems or don't even have AP systems, which is fabulous. And I just have to say that that's been a lot of work. Um, and one reason is in SNOMED is because member nations who were contributing needed to have it in their content. Okay, fine. Well, why do we care? Well, um, this is the, to the point of the use of an ontology. This is a weird expression. It, it's something Rory and his crew made up, but you could do it in SQL, by the way. 
So give me the histologic type of all um, neoplasms that are located in any part of the digestive system. Well, you get a lot of content. There's 19 concepts all the way from the oral cavity to the anus. Now, that's probably not exactly what you're hoping for. If we, in, in Nebraska, you would say that this is all the way from the asshole to the squeak, right? Okay? <laughs> but we care, right? Well, why? Because I want to start to look at logical queries. In this case, I really didn't want to know everything from the in, indoor to the outdoor. Um, I was really more consistent, worried about what was in the GI tract. Well, I can refine that with my, is that, oh, my laser pointer. That thing right there, that thing called inherent location, and that concept, those little symbols there mean anything that's considered a subtype of the GI tract, and you get your result. So we reduce um, our return value to seven concepts, so histologic types of, the, of primary malignant neoplasms of the GI tract down to seven. And it's kind of funny that Rob McClure, who, we had a great discussion at dinner last night, why would you want to look at two different, you know, if you would, um, loin parts, one with a very broad and one with a very narrow expression, you know, constriction, if you would. Well, here's one. I want to do it along multiple axes. So in this case, I want to look at histologic types of proliferative masses that are in the GI tract. So I've broadened or narrowed the type of abnormality that I'm interested in as well as allowing myself to either be more specific and granular or very broad in terms of the body system I'm looking at. So this would be one of those examples. And why would I care? Well, maybe I really care because I want to look at outcomes, excuse me, outcomes related to various types of neoplasias at a surgical margin, whether it was an invasive carcinoma that was left, whether it was a neoplasia that was left, or it was some graded dysplasia that was left. Okay, so this is really, you know, this is big stuff, and, and, and we think it's important. We have implemented this in a tumor bioregistry, biorepository, excuse me. And since we don't have time, and I, I wouldn't bother you with it anyway, but I want to look at all, let's say, bring this down to all primary malignant neoplasms of the colon that are only carcinoma, with extension to the muscularis propria and nodal involvement. That query takes just seconds to run all using the SNOMED concept model um, in, in terms of the concept model against actual reported surgical cases. So very brief, Stan, I hope I kept it in 15 minutes. I don't know if anybody has any questions. This is kind of wonky stuff. Yeah, hi, Clem. Yeah, so is this going to be constrained by the SNOMED historic uh, license agreement or is it be open and free? Um, I, I think what's going to happen is with the, with the agreement, this all becomes um, available to the LOINC extension and have, can have a LOINC term on it for both question and answer, Clem, and then it's fully distributable. So, I mean, that's why I was really excited about that because especially as I work with the ICCR nations, several are SNOMED member nations, but many, many are not, especially, especially in the uh, Asian Rim. Uh, those are countries that don't use SNOMED at this point in time but are very, very involved in the development of these protocols. So we should let, this should be work that could get into their hands, but we should also be able to let our registries be harmonized, even though we just choose to use a different identifier for the same thing. So that was our goal. Okay. We have a question online from sure. Andrea Pickus. Oh. oh, sorry, Andrea, I, I couldn't hear you. I knew, it's scary when you know their voices, right? Hi, Andrea. <laughs> good morning, good evening. Um, thank you for all your work on the SNOMED pathology content. My question related to Clem's is if the CAP cancer protocol concepts um, that have been previously restricted by licensing, um, both by CAP and AJCC, which has been a barrier for LOINC to create terms, as discussed at the mm -hmm. 2018 winter LOINC meeting, and with the newfound SNOMED LOINC agreement, if all those contents could be available for free, and if there's going to be corresponding LOINC concepts for the questions um, for pathology as well to help promote interoperability globally. Okay, I'll try to Any answer that and stay under my time. Because we have a facilitator here, and she's going to scare me. She's already <laughs> scaring me. All right, so easy. Actually, that's kind of an easy answer. Um, 
Cap will always be licensed. So forget cap. Sorry, Hung. Um, it's not cap I'm worried about because the U.S. has got that. That covers only the U.S. domain. ICCR is free for use. ICCR is already free. We are binding these terminologies to the ICCR content, and they will have to worry about how they can distribute that content when it's snowmetted, if you would, to nations. But yes, and Andrea, to your point, we want them loinked. <laughs> I, I, hate, I hate to say something loinked. It sounds like a real word. I mean, it's common. Okay. We're among friends. So I want it linkified because it needs to be distributable to many other nations. And quite frankly, I will just be very frank, it'll be easier to distribute linkified term with this ICCR because ICCR does not enforce licensing in the same way as the CAP or, or SNOMED CT would in terms of member nation content. So I actually think it's a real positive. That help, Andrea? She's muted yes, now. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to stay on time and not be in trouble. Okay. Thanks. So, <clears throat> like a good facilitator, Virginia reminded me that we skipped over a slide, uh, which is a, a slide that summarizes the uh, accomplishments. Yeah, we could go back if we could. If we can. Go all the way. Get it. it goes you, know, you know what it looks like. <laughs> now. <laughs> there we go. Um, so. Um, this is a format that we're trying to, to use uh, for committee reporting, basically to say what you know, what have we accomplished, uh, what what what's the work we're doing right now, and what are our six month objectives. And so, for the for the clinical committee, I mean the 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 big thing that we accomplished was was getting the new collaboration agreement in place with SNOMED. And the work, work underway is, you know, planning <laughs> how we're going to get together uh, to talk about the actual practical uh, logistics and, and policies related to that work. Uh, and, and the goal would be that we can answer some of the questions that were asked today about, well, what's, what's the timing? What's the roadmap? Uh, what are we going to do first? How soon will things be available? Uh, so those are the things that we're trying to do. Uh, it's um, in some ways embarrassing that I don't have more things to say on here on what we've accomplished. Um, so we'll try and spiff that up next time uh, and give a better quick. But any questions about that before we move forward? Okay. Uh, for uh, the rest of the time, we've got uh, some questions and uh, We'll just talk about these things. Uh, if we get done early, great. If we don't, uh, if we don't get through all of the items, then uh, we can pick them up on our regularly scheduled uh, LOINT committee conference call, clinical committee conference calls. So, um, uh, do we have other slides for this? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, while Marjorie's finding the slide, uh, the first topic uh, is a question, and, and it's an honest question. I'm not trying to bias the, um, uh, the outcome. One of the challenges that I've seen uh, being on the implementation side of, of LOINC is the delay between the time that we need to code and uh, when when we get a real code. Uh, so to say more about that, uh, you know, we're developing software. Uh, it could be a de decision support application or something else. And there's uh, there are concepts that don't exist yet uh, in LOINC. 
and we request those and my estimation i guess now is that between the time that we request a code and the time that we get a code it's somewhere between three months and six months uh, in in the time delay and what that means is uh, we need to go ahead with the development of the application because i can't i can't tell intermountain uh, sorry we need to have a six month delay here while we're waiting for a code so what we're forced to do is make a temporary code uh, and and then move forward with software development uh, and then when we get a real LOINT code then we come back and we can change that but as a lot of you know that the challenge is that um, I guess the the phrase I like to use is quick and dirty lasts forever once you've got a temporary code in place there everybody asks the question well why would I go back and change that to the standard code uh, and so uh, thinking about what we'd like to do is uh, there I don't know if there's a perfect solution to this but the idea is that there would be some way to get if you will a temporary code that would then if if it was approved that code would stay the same so you wouldn't have to go back and change it the only time you'd have to change it is if the code you asked for already existed and so they would tell you that you know that one already existed uh, and and I don't see any any escaping that if you you know if you're asking for a code you got a temporary code and it was actually uh, what you were asking for is something that already existed then you would need to change it uh, but Otherwise, it would be much better for us because what we would have is the the code that we use temporarily would uh, would continue and have the same meaning uh, as it was requested. So the the question and I guess the discussion is: uh, Do people are you having the same need <laughs> and uh, thoughts that you have about whether and and the question is: I'm not trying to design it today. But if 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 this is a need, then what I would do is is ask for volunteers, uh, have a small group of people who would talk about what what would be the best way to implement this, and it would involve uh, front and center, Regan Streif, staff and developers. I would say John, but John retired, so we don't. I guess we have to look to Tim and others. Uh, so, uh, but in that discussion about how how the best way to do this, but is that is that even a need? What are what are people thinking? So there's one thumbs up. Do you want to? I agree fully. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So I've seen uh, I've seen uh, a lot of thumbs up. Yes, just uh, Tariq Kadura from Canada Health Info. I think I think having a temporary code is beneficial. The challenge with that that as you said, once you have the temporary code, it's really hard to go back and ask people to change it to a permanent code. As long as I guess as, as 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 we have some sort of a disclaimer that you use a temporary code at your own kind of risk until it's fully validated and confirmed that's the fully permanent loan code so yeah i think that's good yeah. input yeah yeah <clears throat> i had the same assumption you know you if you're going to do this you what you hope you could do is is formalize the fact and let everybody know there is some risk in this and that we actually need to allocate some people to change the code if if it's not right uh, but hopefully it'd be right most of the time and and then you'd have real value from having a permanent code even though it was started out as temporary so may i ask may i ask a question yeah yeah yesterday there was uh i'm here stan <laughs> um Yes, so there was a discussion about submissions and the way uh, Reagan Shreve uh, received uh, the um, submissions. I hope that you only consider uh, submissions that were properly uh, sent to Reagan Shreve and not by email or something. Well, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think what whatever we propose here would have to be consistent with what's being proposed in terms of, yeah, uh, things that are... I, I guess I don't know all of the details there, but I would say my general comment would be that this this would be for things that are officially requested, 
in accordance with Regan Streif's rules for submissions. So. Can I make one comment? Sorry. I know you didn't ask for concerns, but. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I have, I have when I ask for concerns. comments, I want concerns and not just, yeah. Okay. So my biggest concern is that if a temporary code is assigned, that will reduce the incentive for people to provide the necessary information. So right now there's a lot of back and forth communication in order to get all of the details so that the code can be fully defined and it's created appropriately. But the moment we assign an identifier, then they don't, there's, they don't have to do anything else because they already have their code. Right. So well, then they only have a temporary code. So they don't, well, but it's, that will be the permanent that, code uh, if approved. And, I mean, it's a it's a good point. I don't. Yeah. Do you see just, any? Did you see any way to mitigate that? I mean, if we put a status on it, you know, saying it's temporary or something, and then, you know, never promoting it, I guess, if they don't provide the information. But so that's one concern. I guess the second concern is, what if a code is assigned and then that concept it's decided that it doesn't need to be created, not because it's a duplicate and they should get a different code, but just because for whatever reason it's not a valid concept. Once it's already out there, it's really hard to bring it back. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why for a long time for the pre-release page, we only publish things that were like, you know, completely vetted. Um, but with COVID, obviously, all of that changed um, just because once you push it out, you can't, you know, bring it back and deprecate it. I mean, we can deprecate it, but we can't unpublish it. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if we can make. I think my my response to that is, um, yeah, we we've just got to publish and educate people about both things. One is, yeah, your job isn't done just because you put in a submission. If we have questions, you've got to answer those questions. You, you've got to you've got to be willing to communicate to figure out what this thing is and make it a valid code. But the other thing is 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 to emphasize that having a temporary code is not the same thing as having a real code. And that it, that it's deprecated, and in a sense, you're at risk. Uh, at, and what you would hope is that we're not, uh, especially at a national level or something. For instance, you would never want those temporary codes showing up in U.S. CDI or something like that. Those things are not, you know, candidates for, if you will, truly interoperable exchange until a, a real code. But, yeah. Other. Uh, come on. Yeah. What What would, for example, what would, would be possible if you you for such codes, you start with 999, then it's clear it's a temporary code. And then uh, you delete it automatically after a certain period of time. Doesn't that work? Well, there, uh, well, there, there are strategies for doing that. That's what I didn't want to do in this meeting is design how the code worked. <laughs> so, so, Dan. Um, I concur with both of Swabna's uh, concerns or worries, the suggestion I might have for the committee that works on this is to consider actually a separate code system for assigning these temporary identifiers. Certainly within HL7, we have a similar situation and in IGs all the time, authors are making up temporary codes in the balloting process or the, the development process, but those are not labeled as coming from Moink or SNOMED or et cetera. They're more ephemeral and that may help uh, alleviate some of the issues around understanding is this a real code a temporary code has it been fully vetted or not because um, that validation issue is certainly key but once people think it's a link code then they're going to start to try to validate it against various things and if it's not really published yet it'll never that won't work so maybe think of a uh, separate coding system yeah so yeah uh, we have some questions in the chat and then I see Rob's hand up as well I gotta go. Uh, who is who's asking? Is that John? Oh, sorry. Uh, or Ted? So, who, who's in line first, Rob or <laughs> Rob, John Snyder, or Ted Klein? You guys can duke it out. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quick. I'll be quick. So, I, I'm just gonna say I agree with the concerns that Swatna had and and what what Dan said. Uh, I'm, I didn't hear why we need to actually provide temporary codes other than just letting people make up their own codes, which they would well, do I, anyway. I, maybe somebody, maybe I'm mistaken. I mean, in, in my experience, the, the advantage is, uh, you know, for codes submitted from Intermountain, 
95 percent of those get created and and so if we had a temporary code that becomes permanent then we we put the code in our code we create our application and we don't have to change anything as long as the code really gets created. We only have to change it if we were wrong, if we asked for a code that didn't need to be created. Okay. So that's the advantage of having the temporary code is that you're really using the real code from the start, assuming that you're asking for something that was accurate and good. Yeah, no, so, okay, I, I was kind of thinking there's an advantage outside of the requesting institution. It's really focused on the requesting institution's needs. And, and anyway, I, I mean, I have an opinion about this that, again, aligns with Swapna. <laughs> okay. Okay. So can we have John Snyder next, and then we'll take Ted Klein? Yeah, that's. I think that's a valid concern. I guess my question, and, and this is this is a real question: how how long does the codes for trial use take any shorter time than codes that are fully vetted and published? No. So, I guess my question: I mean, we could decide not to do it, uh, but then the value wouldn't be there either. <laughs> so it's a trade-off between the risk. Uh, that Swapna's voiced and and basically just saying, okay, you know, do whatever you have to do in terms of making a temporary code to get by. Uh, I'm just, again, my, my viewpoint is reflecting the fact that uh, we're waiting six months and we won't really wait for six months for a code. We're going to put a code in there. And and as long as, if that, if I'm doing that in an institutional level, then it's not even visible to anybody that uh, that request has been made or, you know, anything else, so. Okay. So I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, uh, I want to completely agree with Swapna. I think um, it's institution specific. Um, I've seen uh, some codes that involved in some efforts where um, uh, less, uh, less diligence is applied to making a complete submission than in other places. And um, uh, this is a concern because there's a cost for waiting and there's a cost for doing it in a hurry and fixing it later. And an even worse cost further out is if it isn't fixed and then you have the dirty laundry that's everyone used and finds its way into national regulations. Um, so this is actually a very, very tricky balance um, and uh, it would probably benefit from having some design work outside of uh, a large group meeting or a small group uh, trying to make some assessments of uh, what the costs and benefits are because um, uh, we have something that's a pain point, um, but we have a very high risk that the pain will be moved elsewhere and then get larger. So um, uh, it needs some careful thought. Yeah, so Ted, I agree with that. I think this deserves um, more, you know, more focused discussion, and then we can bring it to a, a wider, larger group. Yeah, so um, what I would suggest then, uh, so uh, I would solicit those of you who have interest uh, to send an email and what we would do is uh, in, a, in a smaller group, I'm hoping five people or less uh, would uh, come up with a, a concrete proposal about how we might do this, which we would then bring back for further discussion in a bigger audience and either modify that or just say it's not going to work and kill it. Is that okay with folks if we do that? So, um, 
All right. Um, Stan, let me just make a, process, a comment here. We're trying to say what are cross committee issues, and I want to flag this one. This is a cross committee issue. When that group comes back, this is going to come to a cross committee process for that, you know, validating that report and looking at those recommendations. And I'll, I'll do this throughout the meeting just to say okay. we flag this as cross committee. All right. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. All right. Um, I think I'm going to change the order, at least in the, in the I want to talk about, uh, let's do the, okay, so do, go, go two slides. Oh, I can do it? Wow, okay. Ha, okay. Uh, this is a, this is a sort of cross committee. Uh, it's, uh, what we're seeing, uh, and you've seen some of these before, are people who who would like a code to represent the probability of something based on uh, calculations or clinical decision support logic? So the one the, the particular case that came forward was uh, a request from a group that were doing image analysis, and then they wanted uh, excuse me image analysis of X-rays, chest X-rays. And then they wanted a LOIN code basically that said, here's the probability of pneumonia uh, that, that we're getting as a, as a number from the actual image analysis of, of an x-ray. And uh, there are two big ways that I can think of to do this, you know. Uh, one where we make a LOIN code that, that has... Um, yeah, basically says that says you know uh, probability of pneumonia, you know, with a method of X-ray image analysis and point in time and and that sort of stuff. Uh, and the other way is is to make a battery where we have a general structure for a battery of of representing the probability of something, and in that probability you say, well, what what is the what is the thing that you're that you're calculating the probability of. In this case, it would be pneumonia. Uh, how did you do it? Uh, there could be, de you know, very detailed things about, about it because I can imagine that there could be um, an X-ray image analysis probability from an algorithm developed by Stanford University and another one that was developed by uh, somebody else. Uh, so you'd want you may want to know a lot of detail about the algorithm, not only algorithm, but maybe the version of the algorithm if the algorithm, you know, changed over time. So there, there could be an argument for doing a panel that post coordinates the information so that you know independently the name of the disease, uh, the probability. There could be differences in the probability too. That is, it could be uh, an actual numeric probability or it could be uh, an ordinal probability of low likelihood, uh, you know, moderate, uh, high likelihood, et cetera. Uh, th so those things could be represented, et cetera. So uh, again, we would invite both th thoughts about uh, how we represent uh, these kind of risk of concepts. And there's probably been a lot of discussion that I haven't been a part of already in in codes that we've created for this. I don't know, Swapna, if you have, have. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I thought we had something similar, but I'm not finding anything. But I like your idea and the number, uh, the panel. So uh, other thoughts and discussion about how, got, got better, better thoughts than either of these two about how you could represent risk, Dan? I think you captured it well. I think you'll see similar models or analogies, right, with uh, survey instruments and so forth, right, that right. have similar yeah. kinds of various variables and ways of computing things. Um, I think from a scaling perspective, it's natural to want to do the sort of break out the attributes and not have to make a bajillion specific codes. Um, I think it will require some clear education and a long-term view to get people to shift to a model like that because it's simpler to have like the one code that I program in my thing that then acts on that one code to know that oh this is the pneumonia risk score or whatever um, 
but I think that in the long run, that's probably uh, probably worth the effort. And you know, I think I'd encourage. That. I can't necessarily think of a, a third option here. We have, well, uh, we have oh, Clem, Clem, and then we have... Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't put my hands up yet, but I meant to. Uh, yeah, there was another problem. Is how how you represent the probability in the field. Like, is it one out of 100? You know, is it a probability percentile? A percent, you know. So there's there's a couple of different string methods of, of saying the probability. And that's independent of the issue about how you might bin it, you know, into different, different bins. But... It's complicated. What I was thinking along that line, Clem, is that um, th those could, if you will, could be sort of uh, different options in the thing. So you actually have something that was called numeric probability or percentile probability or just nominal, not nominal, ordinal probability as independent, you know, and you could choose the one that was appropriate for what kind of algorithm you're using. That's that's kind of the way I was thinking about it. Yes. Uh, John Snyder, uh, does that dovetail into your question or do you have a separate question? No, that answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, so um, I'm in a quandary here. I mean, I, I, we already do have risk of things, but we what they are is survey instruments. Right. So, I mean, and then it may not even be that specifically named risk of, but they are, we absolutely have those. And that's the way that they've been traditionally captured. I mean, people don't hopefully just come up and, and, you know, ask the medical student and the resident and then the attending, what do you think the risk of disease is? And they give a number and then they record it. I mean, that hopefully isn't the way it's working. So there's a little bit more to it. And, and I think that we should, if we're going to do this, we should capture the full instrument because it would be an instrument and then it gets to, you know, yeah, whether it's a percentile or something like that. That being said, you see this a lot, right? You see this final result. And in fact, we do exchange those things as final results when they've done the survey instrument. And, and if you look at instance data, a lot of times that's all they care about, right? It's that one piece. So there's that one link code that represents that final number, and that's actually what's exchanged. So I'm sensing that we need to acknowledge that both things are going on, and perhaps what you're saying, the way to do that is to make sure that it's understood that if, we, if someone does exchange something that's risk of disease X, which would be clearly X can't be you know, go look in another spot. It has to be the code for that particular survey instrument's um, risk assessment. And if we do do it that way, I think it's safer than just saying, you know, it can be a risk of anything, and then you fill in the X. That's definitely not something I'd be supportive of. Yeah. Well, there, there, it, it comes to mind, I mean, I haven't thought about this before, so I appreciate the comment that, that I mean, there are kind of two situations. One, where the thing is, is more or less a black box. I mean, we're not going to know the details of what they did in the image analysis. There's, there's a process there. We could get them to identify that so that we knew, you know, uh, it was whatever, the, however they named the algorithm and, the, you know, we could version it and say this, this is the algorithm they're using at that point in time. And that's different than than the sur than, than a typical survey where you actually have the answers to the questions and then the conclusion, and that's that's a sort of different situation. We need to consider both of those, and the, and obviously if it's a conclusion to the survey, then there has to be a tie to the rest of the questions and the the other information that that that, that conclusion was based on. So, yeah, you got a question from online. I do. Ken Wang, go ahead. standard or practice all the way to you know an individual investigator's research technique and I think uh, you know there will be individuals all along that spectrum who will be interested in link codes and just as a general question 
how does this group feel um, that a specific method or a specific technique, what, what criteria does it need to meet in order to rise to the level of you know, what should be published as a role? So, I, to make sure I understand or we're, that, that we're communicating, I mean, the, the, if, you, if you did the panel, well, if you did the panel approach, what you're talking about then is that there, there, would, there would be a method field in that panel that would say how, how essentially, how did you arrive at this, uh, at this probability? And um, I would be inclined to say, you know, especially if we wanted this to be a, uh, a part of, of research studies that were going on that would test the validity, then I would be very permissive in in saying, okay, we'll give you a, you know, uh, we'll give you the uh, intermountain imaging analysis version one value as a value of the of the method that was used, uh, and whether that, you know, whether that. What that would allow then is is communication of information that that accurately reflected what was known or done at the time, with uh, and and allow researchers to exchange that data without saying, oh, this is an approved method. Uh, I think approval of the method or adoption of the method based on peer review or other uh, other information would come later. Um, but that's my thinking. But uh, I, I don't think assignment of a value to a particular thing. I hope people wouldn't mistake that for um, medical validity, if you will. Yeah, thank you. I mean, feel free to, to say more if, if that doesn't make sense. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Can I make one comment? Or is there anybody else? Oh, you can make a comment, even oh. if there is somebody else who wants to make a comment. <laughs> Thanks. Swapna, we also have a comment from Andrea, but go ahead. Okay, sorry. So just to build on what Ken was asking and then Stan, what you said. So I think if we had the generic uh, panel, then for things that were only at one institution or were in you know research phase or whatever, then you know those could be represented that way. And then once they are validated and adopted across institutions, then we could make a pre-coordinated code. And I think we have some risk codes right now, um, and maybe that's, those are the ones that Andrea is talking about in her comment. Um, but those are ones like for PE or various cancer risks and stuff. And those are ones that we look to see, you know, are multiple places using them because we didn't want to make codes just for, um, you know, like one institution or one research study. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, it, it might be a, yeah, we might want to have both things uh, intentionally uh, when they become, be and, and it goes to actually, you know, the comment that Rob made too, that once, once something is well known, then it's great to have a single code for it and everybody knows how to use that and exchange it. So that's a good point. Just to slide in Andrea's comment online, the risk concepts don't appear too much different from the laboratory risk scores, such as lipid panels with cardiac risk scores that are commonly implemented already. Sorry, I just didn't hear that. Sorry. Okay, again, from Andrea Pickas, she says the risk concepts don't appear too much different from laboratory risk scores, such as lipid panels with cardiac risk scores that are commonly implemented already. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Okay, yeah. Oh. Comment, yeah. I was just going to say that, uh, especially with um, AI and machine learning, that there's a, a continuing interest in making sure that uh, the method is documented with the um, score or assessment. And so I think in the future, uh, just having an assessment saying that this is somehow based on AI isn't going to fly and that it will involve documenting, uh, you know, 
versioning or, yeah. or what have you. And there might there might be middle ground here where we could make a you know a, a code that said risk of you know risk of breast cancer or risk of pneumonia, uh, but then make a smaller panel that said but here's the here's here's the details of the method by which this was derived. So it would be instead of a five element panel, it might be you know one code that pre-coordinates you know what you're what you're at risk for and whether it's a probability or an ordinal, but then have a separate separate code still that would give you the detailed method by which that was derived. Okay, a good thought. Okay. So um, is, have we answered all the questions? Uh, that's, yeah, okay. that's so, all I had to say so about the, this. So the last question is, do we see it? this is something that we would bring back cross committee it, it seems to have applicability yeah, I, I think so too across committees yeah yeah, yeah. okay um, so uh, our time time is up for this yeah. well we got three minutes I guess I don't think we can oh, talk it oh oh 315 no we got till 315 yes, okay yes. so, um, all right yeah. onward then yeah, I skipped okay. over. This one. What we have it? a break at three, and we, then we come back for lab. It it the. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we can go with whatever. <laughs> Uh, no, this this is the whole other committee now. Yeah, there we go. This one. Uh, okay. Uh, one more, one more back. Actually, uh, one more. Yeah, that one. Um, so this is a question. Um, where it comes up, uh, and this this existed early on uh, when we made LOINC codes for uh, NACER cancer reporting. Uh, and what it, the question is, or the issue, I guess, maybe it, it better to say is, you have, um, You have this. You have a structure like uh, HL7 um, that has, or for that matter, let's talk about fire, where you have uh, a fire resource, and then you have attributes or data elements inside of that thing. So inside of the the um, the fire patient resource, you have things like first name, last name. Uh, address, you know, a bunch of that kind of information. And in other resources, you also have things that, that um, say uh, in the observation resource, for instance, you have uh, a code for the observation that, you know, would be a LOINC code. And then you have other fields, though, that would say, uh, depending on the kind of observation, you would have uh, a field in that structure that said uh, and here's where the method would go or here's where uh, the system or anatomic part would go if you're if you're doing that as a post coordination in that structure and um, so that's that's one kind of uh, of situation uh, and and the question well I'll give the second situation the second situation is where you're doing uh, information modeling, uh, which is just a little bit different than, than a fire resource, but you have um, a model then where you have attributes that, uh, for instance, around a diagnosis would say, again, things like, you know, what, what, is the, 
what's the diagnosis you're trying to make or and if you're doing post coordination what's the what's the body location where that uh, condition or situation occurred uh, additional information about severity or other kinds of things and uh, the the question that I'm trying to pose or ask is uh, is it appropriate to make a LOINC code for those things that exist as a field or attribute in the information model of a syntactic standard like FHIR or, uh, for that matter, HL7 version 2 or other things. So in, in a simple sense, it is, should we make codes uh, or as needed for things like last name, first name, etc., where those things are attributes inside of the structure of FHIR or other kinds of information modeling. Now, to, to give a historical perspective, uh, NACER and some other things, um, they, they didn't have, um, th their approach, it, as I remember, it was, it was, a, it was a delimited record, uh, and so you only knew what things were by the position in the record, and there wasn't uh, an official uh, other than in their documentation, it said first name, last name, that sort of thing. And and what we decided was to make LOINC codes for those things because it, it established a computable meaning for that field, if you will, in the structure. Uh, but, you know, as we get into things that are, you know, first name, last name didn't seem to be a problem, but if you get into things now that are saying method or other things that are very general, but in context would hold uh, a specific value set, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of an editorial question uh, about whether we want to make those kind of codes for data elements that exist as part of the syntactic structure of a standard, of a, of a data exchange standard. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm communicating it well or not. But Dan, help. I think it makes sense. Um, two additional historical comments. One is, you know, way back we said we didn't want to do it way, 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 way back. And then we realized for these reasons that we kind of needed to and or it was a service to the user community to make these available. And for quite a while, we tried to actually signal in the database by declaring what we knew specific fields in say HL7 V2, it's the PID, blah, 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 whatever the segment was, so that people would have a transformation to get there is a lot of work and we never could keep it up. And of course, now if you have multiple versions of each of these specifications, whether V2, CDA, fire, it's like impossible to sort of keep up. So what I would say is I think it makes sense and proceed cautiously with justification. So certainly in contexts where we found these codes actually very useful in, in various survey instruments, where some of those things that had dedicated positions in a syntactic structure appeared as data entry you know, fields that people needed to fill out. And so to represent that whole structure in LOINC was, was very, very valuable. So we, we, we sort of want to retain that. Now, of course, we wouldn't like blindly say, hey, for every data element that's in fire, like let's make a code for it. Like that would be sort of silly. Um, but I certainly would support, you know, this continued direction with the justification of how and why it is useful to the community as the starting sort of guardrail uh, for, for how many we'd want to make. Yeah. Good comment. Yeah. Rob. So I'm going to disagree with my distinguished colleague. Um, specifically fire, I don't think we need to do it. And, and the reason that I don't is that I, the reason that we did these before was there was no way to actually um, you know, point to the thing that was the model element easily. And, you know, particularly if we were talking about um, uh, CDA objects or, uh, you know, some other objects. But for fire, there is. Now, it's, you know, it's not s small. It, you don't have a small code. And I, but I don't find that to be a compelling element because you got a path, right? you got a fire path. That fire path effectively identifies the object. 
And each one of those objects, again, in fire has a definition. It may be a lousy definition, but it's got a definition. And so, in fact, there is a computable representation of the model element. It's fire path, and it'll get you to a definition. So, so, so I don't think we need to make codes for these. So I want to disagree with you. Uh, you, you. You have an identity, but it has no capabilities relative to the other things that you want from a code. You have no ability to make synonyms for it. You have no way to easily map it to something uh, using the same technology that you use to map from any other concept to any other, you know, between. So I politely disagree with your uh, with your statement. Yeah, no, you're right. You don't have that in a code system, right? I'm, I'm not, you know, I hear you. I'm not convinced you're, that you're not ready to succumb. <laughs> I'm not ready to succumb because, you know, again, I, you know, we're we're arm wrestling over over a kind of a, a philosophical point. You know, the end users is who we care about, right? Not not us. And end users make databases and they make files and they make columns and rows and things like that. And so, I'm I'm not you know I'm not going to die on my sword on this by any stretch. But I think that that we are making something that there is another solution for and that if we communicated to people, particularly fire communicated to them with regards to how to accomplish this, there'd be other ways to do it. I, I would absolutely agree with you, though, that if you said, look, that means that everybody can't exchange one concept map, you know, you know, there, because you can all have your own different things. And that was one of the main reasons we make standards. And I, I wouldn't be able to argue that down. But I'm just saying that I think that when we look at all the things that we need to do, when there's a way to accomplish this already, if there's not, you know, I'd like to hear the really compelling reason that says there has to be a true a, a external standard representation of a model's inner workings. Well, it's, yeah, it's not so much the inner workings as the definition of the data elements within it. And it, it you know, uh, to just say more about, I mean, my the reason I brought it up here is because it's, it is that there are a set of people who are trying to make semantic mappings between many different syntactic representations. And this just gives you a common meaning that you can map then to many different things. You can map it to CDA, you can map it to HL7 version 2, you can map it to DICOM, you can map it to uh, uh, CDISC, you can map it. That's what I'm looking for, and that's the business I'm in. That's that's my selfless purpose. I was going to say, that sounds pretty self, self oriented, but I, I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Yeah. We have an online comment question from John. I'm going to ask you to read that out loud. It seems complex. Sure. Stan, I think I see where you're going with this. And it just asked the question, is there a need for a link code representation for a fire resource in order to translate from CCDA to fire and back? Because there is that emerging B2B middleware layer to transmit clinical data to payers that is doing this translation. Um, so do we need a more robust support for that is what you're asking? Yeah, and 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 I'm trying to serve more use cases than than you know fire to uh, CCDA or something else because there are activities going on there. I could make the same argument: uh, the mapping of these things to OMOP data elements or to whatever. Uh, I want something that works for all of those things. That you know whether there's a a current mapping to fire or not, something that in the terminology space in the semantic space is establishing a known defined meaning for that data element uh, and then I can use it wherever I can use it to make maps to C disk I can make maps to CCDA I can make maps to x12 transactions I can make maps to anything but I've established a semantic meaning of that data element that's my that's my selfless purpose in doing proposing this yeah Tim yes, uh, I think things which should be identified should have coded identifiers so I support you yeah Thank you. And, I, and I, I mean, I would take what Dan said, too. I, I'm not trying to do this globally. 
when we need it and when it makes sense and when it has value, I would do it. But I wouldn't try. I wouldn't. I wouldn't blindly try and make codes for everything. I, I just wouldn't do it. I, for one thing, there, you know, a hundred fire resources that are never going to see the light of day, and I'm. I would. I wouldn't go make codes for those until there's actually people using them. So. Okay, uh, yeah, no comment. Um, have you looked if there are other standards which have such codes already, which would serve the purpose? Does it have to be Loink that provides a code for last name? It, it, it doesn't have to be, but I don't know of others. I, I don't use any others. <laughs> well, that's because I'm no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure sort of biased that, that way, but yeah. Uh, but do you know, do you know other global, you know, so first name, last name, I know would appear in a lot of different in a lot of different standards. I don't know that it appears in any of, you know, uh, of the standards that, that have been adopted for use globally. Um, well, that depends on what you mean by globally. I think if you just look at the medical community and globally, then you get into a very narrow subset, but there are other communities that have global standards that would be already have lots of things for last name, first name, street address, which probably have put a lot of thought into the various kinds of names and different nationalities and so on. I, I, maybe, I would... maybe maybe tell me about those because it, I mean if it's local then it's not serving my purpose. Okay, if it's not something that I can share and 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 communicate globally. No, no, I was thinking more of the of the uh, standards that come out of the information technology community, but not specifically medical, because this is not particularly medical information. Well, first name and last name isn't. No, and nor street address. But no, or street address. But the other ones that are more interesting are methodology, uh, method, the methodology right. field, the anatomic pathology, you know, the, the location of the fracture, you know, in a, in, in, you know, in a loink observation, you have the anatomic location of the observation. Those kind of fields are specific to medicine and they're not global. Uh, there, there, there may uh, be good reasons, also. but but to me, <laughs> but but to me, I mean, those other standards that that are coming for first, you know, I, I mean, what I would do is say, okay, you know, the definition of first name, last name, a, a lot of those things actually, you know, in the U.S. and the and the street address or other things, there there is a true standard at least for the whole nation about how addresses are done, and and we would. I would still say we would make a loint code, but the definition of that would come from by referring to uh, the definition that's in the in the postal code standard. So your standard in the Netherlands for street address would be quite difficult to use. Yeah, <laughs> and loint is not a national; it's an international if it has, standard. I, and that's the point. See, is if if it has the same meaning, then that if but it's possible that. Uh, street address has a different syntax, a different meaning in a different country, in which case there would be two LOINT codes that, you know, would say this, you know, and probably not distinguished by saying it was the Netherlands address and the U.S. address, but by saying it's an address that has first the street number and then the street and then the whatever. And that, again, establishes commonality between an address standard and fire or somebody else who's using those fields. It's establishing a common meaning that I can map between those different syntactic representations. Um, Stan, we're, we're, all, we're at time. We're at time. So one more, yeah, question from Just a, online. Just a comment from online from Andrea Pickus. It also assumes data provenance fidelity of a data element from source to all downstream entities. This isn't occurring for everything currently. To. And may I quickly just ask for our in-person attendees, if you could say your name before you make your question or comments, we can all hear that. That would be great. So I, I did, I still, I didn't quite understand what the question or comment was. Andrea, do you want to unmute and just ask it?
No, I. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, our time is up. Uh, so next up is break. <laughs> And uh, so we've got uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so we should be back at 325 local time here. Thank you.